It's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Central Europe, and it's Space Café Web Talk time. Our Space Café Web Talk, 33 minutes, with Emmanuel David and Dr. Minou Ras Nazabapathy will begin soon. Thank you for joining us for our talk today about rewarding safe and sustainable behavior in space. As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. Spacewatch.global is a Europe-based online platform for information in it about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all of our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. So we really appreciate that. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcasts. The last one featured Urs Ganze, a super space nerd. And I mean, he talked about how you can build a spacecraft and so on. So we released it today. It's just worth to give it a listen. For all our fans of audio content, we have new episodes on our Space Cafe radio shows as well. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively to become a space watcher. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our web page, page in the events section and on YouTube. So I recognize that every time I'm announcing my guest, I'm going to a stage of excitement. And I can tell you that is real. And I am excited to talk with all these wonderful people. So nothing will change here today, especially as one of my guests is the auntie of our hearts at Spacewatch.global. And before I'm going too far, a very warm welcome, Emmanuel David and Dr. Minou As Nasa Bapati again in our Space Cafe today. Emmanuel is the executive manager, the awesome Emmanuel is the executive manager of the EPFL Space Center, that entity that manages the operations of the space, uh, space sustainable rating. And Minu is a research engineer at the Space Enabled Research Group at, the, at MIT's Media Lab. And she has been involved in the design and the development of the rating. And she was a witness when we created Space Watch eight years ago. And now those of, of you are in our Space Cafe today, Manuel and Minu, welcome again. So let's kick it off. Last year, I spoke with Nikolai Klistov of the World Economics Forum about the Space Sustainable Rating. Shortly after, in 2021, the EPFL Space Center eSpace has been selected to host and operate the Space Sustainable Rating with a target to launch its operation in early 2022. So that's where we are today. And now today we will talk about how this rating has been designed and how operations are intended to be launched this year. So we are living obviously in a multifaceted, fragmented world. Making consensus is not a reality, unfortunately. So what is the definition, what is your definition of space sustainability and i know it's a hard one but we have to start somewhere so <laughs> let's start emmanuel please what is your definition thank you very much dustin and thank you also for having us here today uh, indeed it's a very hard question and as you mentioned there is uh, as of today no real consensus on what is space sustainability but I like to um, say that so one of the definition where we can start is the one from the UN COPUS in the long term sustainability guidelines, <clears throat> where they mentioned that space sustainability is the is defined as the ability to maintain the conduct of space activities indefinitely into the future in the manner that realizes the objective of equitable access to the benefit of exploration and the use of outer space for peaceful purposes in order to meet the needs of the present and the, uh, the present generation while present preserving the outer space environment for the future generation. So this is a very broad definition. And indeed the aim also of the long-term sustainability guideline is to offer um, a way also to decline this definition. But 
<clears throat> it's true that there is also a, then on how you define more clearly space sustainability and how you can measure it. And this is a gap that SSR is trying also to fill and is proposing also a definition of how we could see also space sustainability. I think we will go into the details there um, during our talk. So Minu, as we know, as we heard, there might be different opinions. What is your view on space sustainability? So thanks so much, Torsten. And uh, before I start, just uh, thank you so much again for inviting us to join the Space Cafe today. And I'm so happy to be able to do this with a good colleague of mine, Emmanuel. So in my role at MIT, uh, I think a lot about what Emmanuel was saying about the equitable uh, access to and the use of space. And we're all very aware that we are increasingly dependent on space technologies in every way and every day of our lives. And if we consider the projected growth of space actors, the miniaturization of technologies, the rise in commercial space activities, and the fact that um, there are lower satellite development and launch costs, it's really in stark contrast to the pace of development of some of these regulatory guidelines and norms of behavior as, uh, as Emmanuel was talking about. So we really see the SSR as a bridge to recognize and reward actors who are actively going above and beyond in the pursuit of long-term sustainability. Before we dig into where we are today and hopefully then also tomorrow, Minu, can you tell us more about the history of SSR? Because you have been also there an eyewitness and I was glad, I think it was Dubai 2017, when this idea was discussed the first time. So tell us a bit about this process and of, of designing it and the history. Absolutely. So uh, I am being very privileged to be part of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Space. And it's a, it's a forum where they gather experts who represent different sectors of the space industry from academia, the commercial and industry sector, um, but also government and agency. And, and our pursuit is really to think about what is the future of the space sector. So LTS, the long-term sustainability and the role of a rating system really evolved from the discussions at the Global Future Council on Space. And in 2019, MIT, alongside the European Space Agency, the University of Texas at Austin and Bryce Tech, formed a consortium to design and develop the very first iteration of the space sustainability rating. And something that we're very proud of is that it is the first rating of its kind in the space industry. And I won't go into too much technical detail, but the design of the SSR is based on rating systems that are used in other industries. Uh, one of which that we quote quite often is the lead rating system that's used on uh, the building, uh, the building industry. So thinking about how buildings are manufactured and and how sustainable the use of the building and energy efficient the building is. So taking that concept and applying it to uh, the space industry to really assess how sustainable satellites and space missions are. So uh, over the course of three years, the SSR was designed really as a composite indicator that takes into account the decisions made by satellite operators in all phases of the mission. So from the design phase all the way through to launch in orbit operations and then disposal as well. And in 2021, uh, EPFL eSpace Center was selected as the administrative organization that would host the SSR and really publicly offer the ratings to different stakeholders in the industry. 
what a wonderful lead over to to Emmanuel. So what is EPFL's role in that and how do you intend to engage with stakeholders in that? Yeah, so <clears throat> indeed, as Minu mentioned, we are been selected to be the host and operators of the rating, meaning we are the people you should contact in order to get a rating. So in order to get engaged, if you're an operator or manufacturer, um, you can contact us for that. Um, we also aim at um, engaging the larger community around SSR. Uh, would it be uh, in order to uh, to be involved about the evolution of the rating, but also to promote it to its um, to to other actors, uh, then the those those stakeholders can also join the the community by uh, joining also uh, an association that we are currently creating, in order to um, create a community around the space Yosemite rating. But EPFL is in university. So how, how can that work or in, in this context? Because I would envision that as a, a private company or intergovernmental or whatever format. So, but as a university, how can you bring yourself in? Yeah, that's a very good point that, that you're bringing. Um, role of uh, university is also to bring new ideas and innovative projects into life. So this is why I would say you can see that eSpace is incubating the SSR in order to create the entity that will then perform the operation. And therefore, we are also creating this association that will then perform the operations, the operational aspect. We believe but that EPFL is also the right place <clears throat> in order to launch this because there are also a lot of research uh, that can um, that needs to be brought in in the the SSR, but that would be also brought out from the SSR and the learning that will will perform uh, with the with the rating. Also, a prerequisite that was given while doing the selection is that it should be also a non-profit organization. And that's also where universities come in because we really have a mission to promote knowledge, a neutral knowledge, I would say, about, um, about a, a topic. And in this case, it's about uh, space sustainability. <clears throat> um, so that's also why a university is the, the good place also to to start uh, such an initiative uh, and the operation and also being neutral as being from Switzerland. Uh, we're also known for uh, neutrality, but we are also not, um, I would say, a country where you have a lot of uh, operators and large system integrators. So that's why also we can also mm -hmm. ensure the neutrality of the rating. Okay. So the EPFL is an in intermediate step for the final vision we will might, uh, talk about later. Mm -mm. Okay, got it. Minu, and sorry, Tosten, you want to if I could, if I could just jump in there very quickly. So I can attest to the fact that it was a very rigorous election process that had several rounds of, uh, of applications and uh, to showcase that EPFL in this case was the best organization to host the SSR. But I wanted to pick up on one key word that Emmanuel just said, and that was neutrality. So in the design and development of the SSR, we knew that we wanted it to be a global rating system that could be applied to uh, any sector. So again, whether it's uh, the commercial side or government side, and we also wanted it to be international. So having an academic institution um, that represented that neutrality was a key factor in the selection process. And, you know, I, I speak for Emmanuel here, but I know that they have been working very closely with a number of stakeholders and will continue to do so as the iterations of the SSR progress. I'm just checked the, the incoming questions. Mark, we will come to that uh, in, a, in a bit. Mino, you, you just picked up neutrality as one of the core values. Are there others, other core values for you for the rating or behind the rating, so to say? 
Absolutely. So when we first started uh, thinking about what the SSR looked like or would look like, one of the key things that we started is having stakeholder meetings. And again, uh, through different sectors of the industry, from government and agency to uh, industry. And we wanted to ensure that the first iteration of the SSR meant that everybody felt like they were included in the discussions, even though the priorities are quite different depending on which part of the space sector you represent. Mm -hmm. And um, as Emmanuel had said already, you know, in designing the SSR, we wanted to ensure that there was a common definition of what space sustainability is, and one definition that could also be measured both quantitatively and qualitatively, and recognizing and rewarding uh, the, the above and beyond actions and decisions that actors were making in order to pursue this. Okay. So, Emmanuel, a hard question. What are concrete rating parameters? Or, um, give us some technical ideas as the size of a spacecraft, the color, or and what is good and what is bad in that, mm -hmm. in that. Because there has to be something bad if you want to rate it. Or is it the numbers? So, mm -mm. yeah. Thanks for the question. Actually, um, so um, the rating is based on six different modules. Um, <clears throat> two of them are um, computational, so meaning they are they are quantified, as um, Minu was was mentioning. So you have the mission index that was developed by the European Space Agency Space Debris Office which assess the impact of your uh, spacecraft, of your mission on the orbital environment, meaning that the type of input you would bring in this, in this, um, uh, in, in this module are the orbit you're going, how long you're gonna stay in orbit, uh, how long uh, are you gonna stay after the end of the mission, for example. Then you have the DIT module, which is the detectability, identification, and tracking, which has been developed by MIT and the UT and UT Texas, which assess how is your spacecraft visible uh, from Earth and how can you so detect this spacecraft, identify, and also track the spacecraft uh, using. Um, uh, ground-based sensors. So the type of input parameter you will have is also um, <clears throat> this, the, the spacecraft geometry, but also the uh, um, uh, the magnitude, also uh, the illumination that, that you can have. The four of the modules are... May, may, yeah. may I jump in here? Um, yeah. Because, Again, I would like to understand what is a good and what is bad in that. When you said, said one parameter is this mission index thing, so it's yeah. about the orbit, how long you stay, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. If I go to a 500 kilometer orbit with my five year mission, is that a good mm -hmm. or a bad thing? And I de orbit within a year or two years. Is that good or bad? Same question for the trackability and visibility. Uh, I mean, if something is trackable and visible, mm -mm -mm then it's also usually very illuminating. So, mm -mm -mm. and, and so, we have this contrast with the astronomy thing, and I think you have been there in, in all, this, all these questions. So, but what is good as what, and what is bad from the rating point of view? So the and rating then, is assessing positive behavior. So we're more uh, focusing on what is good. And indeed um, for the mission index, you will have a better, I would say, Great if uh, you go to an uncrowded orbit and your mission lifetime is very short, uh, let's say. <clears throat> In terms of detect for the DIT module, there has been a real discussion uh, performed and trade off to understand what is the level of um, I would say detectability that the spacecraft should have, not that you can see it. While you um, you you don't hinder too much astronomical uh, uh, observation, I don't have the 
uh, magnitude level in, in, in my head right now, but there has been a, um, a trade-off made on this purpose to understand <clears throat> that it, um, what, what is the good level of illumination that you should have. Uh, so those are two, two examples, indeed. Okay. Minu, you want to chime, chime in here? Or? Again, only to reiterate what uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel was saying. So really thinking about the good behavior of, uh, of actors. I can also uh, share another example. So one of the modules is called external services. Now, the scoring in the external services modules is uh, part of the bonus score. So not what we call the baseline score. That'll give you the tier definition of the SSR, whether it be platinum, gold, silver, or bronze. Um, but this is really sort of an additional bonus score that, uh, that makes up the external services module. Realizing that not all satellites will employ uh, external services. So they might be small sats or uh, they might not have it in their mission objective to have these uh, external services. However, if operators choose to either employ the services of an active debris removal company, um, and they can show us proof that that is part of their disposal strategy, or if they tech on a, a grapple hook, so in the future, they, their satellite has the ability to be removed from a certain orbit by using one of these services, they get the points, although bonus points, but uh, they do get the points for taking these actions uh, that are really forward thinking, whether their satellite be five-year mission or a 25-year mission. So we've designed the SSR again to showcase the, um, the positive steps actors are taking, but we also didn't want to deter actors or missions who might not be suited to some um, some technology adoptions. Okay. I think it's fair and or, um, or to, to, to mention here as well, and please, um, uh, Emmanuel, feel free for this shameless uh, announcement and advertisement of the upcoming course you guys are giving, or workshop, not course, sorry, workshop you're intending uh, to, to, to give. But the future operations to be launched was in the next month. So how, how can I get a rating? That was one of the questions also from Mark Meyer. Thanks for uh, how to get it. I mean, I, I have my, my 500 kilometer orbit mission now. So I, I'm knocking on your doors and say, hey, that's my mission. Here's my plan. Here's my <laughs> paperwork. <laughs> just make me a, an A plus. Yeah, so in order to get a rating, indeed the first step is to get in touch with us. Um, <clears throat> so we're currently finishing the beta testing. So um, by, I would say May, June, we should be uh, able to launch the official operations. And then the process is kind of simple. So we'll have a first meeting to present what are the inputs that are required also for the rating. So today we're still working with a very easy Excel table sheet where inputs have to be filled. And with our experts, um, we, we usually we do at least a loop in order to to confirm that the inputs were correct and maybe to answer some of the questions. Um, we're also working on a web-based platform so then people can, in the second step, also um, fill in the information on this, this platform, meaning that then after, if they have several missions to be rated, they can also uh, see the difference also between the missions and, and reuse it and have an overview of the different ratings. And then we'll compute the input in order to give the, the rating. Um, with the rating, we also provide uh, some feedback and then we also provide um, uh, guidance on how to also improve the rating and how to uh, have also better grade. This is um, very relevant, especially as you can start the process in the early design phase. So you can also understand what are the technical solutions or what are the steps that I put or which are the operational 
uh, aspect that they have to implement in order to be more sustainable. And we know that the earlier those decisions are made, uh, the less impact it has on the mission design costs. <clears throat> so this is also uh, something that we provide. Cool. I think we, we uh, like will dig a bit deeper on that or um, later on. But mm -hmm. Minu, who can be part of that? Is it you? You worded as as the operators uh, earlier on. So is it only operator? Is it the entire supply chain or that that you have in the space sector? Is it also ground segment, governments only? Because when I talked last week with our German our, um, our aerospace our coordinator, she said, "Oh yeah, but it doesn't go so far. We we would like we would like to to see that." So and that that gave me a moment to think. So what is it intended? Is it only really operators? Right. Great question, Torsten. So um, I do want to reiterate that we're still in the very early stages of the SSR. Again, we're just in that first design iteration and, and launch of, uh, of the rating system. So our focus right now is, of course, the operators. And we're very thankful to the alpha and the beta testers that have helped us hone into what the optimal design of the SSR will be. And again, they range from the really big commercial names through to some emerging space nations as well. But as I mentioned before, we've been having uh, from the very early days, these discussions with the range of stakeholders. So we do wanna uh, loop in the, the long-term supply chain of space. So. Uh, one stakeholder that I can talk about is uh, space insurance providers. So we see the SSR is very similar to car insurance or car insurance premium. So if you can prove that you're a safe driver and uh, you wear your seatbelt and you have a secure parking lot, then the insurance that you pay for your car is going to be less and less each year as opposed to if you had multiple accidents, for example. So to have that discussion with space insurance companies and really think about the economic benefits of a rating system and how it could then apply to operators has been very beneficial. Um, earlier, I talked about the external services module. Uh, so talking to the providers of active debris removal services or in orbit service providers about what role they can play uh, to the SSR is uh, again being and crucial. And as we look to the future iterations of the SSR, we also envision that we can incorporate launch providers, and that could also potentially uh, alter the procurement process of how operators select launch providers. So certainly a work in progress. We have a number of modules outside of the six that Emmanuel mentioned that we really want to target and incorporate. But it's taken us three years to come together and, and agree on these six modules. So it will take some time uh, and a lot of discussion with the wider space industry as we uh, incorporate more and more modules. Come on, it took the UN Copius just 10 years to negotiate the LTS. So come on, three years doesn't count. <laughs> no, but honestly, I mean, we are in a situation that we don't have time to, to lose. And just taking the example of the climate change, I mean, we have seen the IPCC report yesterday and with all the disaster that goes on on our planet Earth right now, uh, beside pandemic, beside war, we have that as a big threat. So time is of essence, I, I think very much, at least I put it on my priorities list quite high up. But you spoke about transparency earlier on. Uh, are these companies which are involved or right, are these transparent are they named are they open or are they accessible to others as well or is it still beta hmm, close shop 
in all, in my uh, world. So yeah. I'll take a, a first go and then I'll hand it over to Emmanuel. So, um, Torsten, just on your point uh, about timeliness of things, I think you it's um, you make it so poignant. And honestly, it's not just the space industry uh, recognizing this. It's all industries. And, uh, you know, at MIT, we're also... Uh, working on that research where we call it the pacing problem. So the fact is that there's an exponential growth of technologies and tech adoptions that are being um, put into place into missions in real time, mm -hmm. but there's really no uh, norms of behavior and regulations that um, have caught up to those tech adoptions. So certainly that's absolutely crucial. So when it comes to uh, the rating system, uh, you were talking about transparency. Absolutely. So um, this is a voluntary rating system. So uh, we're very privileged again to work with a number of beta testers and I'll let Emmanuel talk about that more. But so far they've been very public in uh, supporting the SSR as a concept and also being recognized as a beta tester. And so the future, we really want uh, operators to come to us, uh, have their mission rated, and then publicly display it. Emmanuel. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, thanks, Minu. So indeed, there has been several companies that have been involved uh, in the rating, the development of the rating, such as Airbus, Astroscale, you have also AXA, Excel, the insurance, Elsico, Lookin Martin, Planet, SpaceX, Voyager Space Holding, those are a few names. And we've also engaged a, lot, a few more also in our um, advisory group. And they're also talking about transparency. We also <clears throat> uh, put a big emphasis in diversity and inclusion, meaning also geographical diversity. So we also have actors from Asia, Australia. Uh, but also of backgrounds of policymakers and universities, so mm. from academia. Um, so that's why we really want to engage. It's not a closed club, like only operators rating themselves among each other. Uh, it's also uh, other people from academia and policymakers that are also giving their input, but also following this to understand also their needs. Um, I would say on the, for policymakers, to understand, okay, maybe how can I um, also include uh, SSR in my licensing system? Um, not in a way that it could, it should be a hard requirement, but if I have to choose between, uh, if I have to, to choose between two people, two operators, then I will take the one who has a, maybe a better grading in SSR, or maybe this could be also an incentive for them to have an easier licensing uh, process, because I know that a part of it is already covered through the SSR. So those but are- license, Licensing mean that, that the governments have to adapt to that? Because yeah, it means when you. an operator asks for a license to the government, governments to be to be launched. Um, so, um, yeah, so the SSR could be also a proof that uh, they they've been through a certain um, uh, a certain process, and that could also ease up the licensing. Okay. Cool. And we, we got the red flag already from our yeah. production team uh, on that. However, I, I think that's a very fascinating and absolute needed discussion mm -hmm. here. And, and we know, thank you for, for staying up that long um, because she is down in Australia right now and it's quite early in the morning. We don't say how early it is. So, but what is the final vision you have with, the, with SSR? Um, so where are we? Where would you like to see it in five years, in 10 years from now? So for me, the final vision of SSR is that it should be a reference for any people who want to launch something into space, that they have to apply to SSR and they want to apply to SSR in order to show also to the community that they are putting in place uh, this, um, this measure and they are committed also to space sustainability. Um, <clears throat> that's that's one aspect. The other thing is, I would also like to SSR to be recognized at a more global level, not only in the space community, but also within the sustainability community. Uh, you have some movement of people who claim for a 
18th SDG, uh, including space. So it means that when you look at the different um, uh, indicators of sustainability on Earth, you also include space and you also include the SSR. Wasn't it you just pointed out to the to the SDG 18 in one of your posts on LinkedIn? <laughs> yeah, there's a workshop on the Friday okay. yeah, on the absolutely. topic. No, um, Mino, what is your vision of, of the SSR in the next decade or so? Right. Just to build on what Emmanuel was saying, I think for it to be a, a globally recognized rating system, we already have organizations like the SIA who have um, really put forward their support in a rating system like this. And so if we could have other organizations internationally recognize the um, the importance and the usability of the rating system, that would be great. Um, you know, I talked about different modules. When we look at other rating systems used in, in industries outside of space, over the years, they've added on more and more as their environment and as their industry has changed. So I think the SSR needs to be uh, adapted and uh, agile to account for the different technologies that are being developed, but also the policies and regulations. And I, I come back to that point that really our vision is for the SSR to be that bridge. So, and make it easy for actors to pursue sustainability and showcase what they're doing. I would like to, 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 to pick one or two of, of the, the questions because uh, thank you very much, uh, the audience for this fantastic, our input. So Robert Fono, Fon, Fonot, uh, sorry for mispronouncing it uh, eventually, how long does it take the rating or, or the approval protests or in average, what are you envisioning and how is the transparency ensured and combined it with, with a, a question of Kirsten Armstrong. So will you rate satellites already in orbit or only those not yet launched? So those are two very good questions. So the rating um, process. So what we've seen is that um, uh, as in the early moment, there is a, with a more contractual uh, aspect of it in order to protect the data of the operators. Um, this is a part where it can be extended um, due to the legal aspect. But then once this is settled within a few weeks, this should be done. Uh, it's like a few iterations, one iteration at least, and then the time to compute the data. Uh, transparency. Now, if questions, are there costs involved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed. <laughs> uh, indeed um, in okay. order to get a rating, there is a, a fee, which is linked also to the mission type, the size and the okay. type of operators also that are coming to us uh, in order to cover the operational aspects uh, of the, okay. the rating. Um, transparency is, um, I would say, is ensured in the fact that it is a neutral and external entity performing the rating. Uh, this is also why <clears throat> you come to EPFL to, to, and then to the association to, to perform the rating. And then the third uh, question was, the rating can be performed at any different stage of the, the mission. So from early design stage up to the, um, the end of the operations. So uh, everyone can come to us to get the rating. Okay, great. Thank you very much, or both of you, or, or Minu, I don't want to take away this word. Uh, do you want to uh, jump in here on this last question or are you fine with? I think Emmanuel answered it perfectly. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It was such a great pleasure to talk about it. And I promise that uh, we will follow up in the process and <laughs> chase you and see what's what's going on here. So before, you fin uh, before we finish today, please, the audience do not miss out on our upcoming events. On Friday, we have the next Space Cafe banner logs by Chiara Munter and Banu Bazingi. On the next week, um, on the occasion of the International Women's Day, I have the absolute great honor to speak with the wonderful Simonetta Di Pipo about women in space um, and everything around that. So on the 10th, we have our next Space Cafe Australia by Annie Handmar on at 6.30 
a.m. Central European time, just for, 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 the, for the folks that are um, dialing in from Europe. It's quite early, but it's worth to, uh, to um, jump on it. On the 15th, I will speak with Dr. Andreas Wittmer from St. Gallen University about what space can learn from the aviation industry. And on the 22nd, on our hundreds, our um, space cafe. Uh, I have the absolute honor to speak with Josef Aschbacher live here on stage. See, and who doesn't know uh, Josef? He is the uh, director general of the European Space Agency. Two days later, we have another Australia-based event, 9, 9.30, a bit more comfortable for us in Europe, the next space cafe breakfast with Stephen Freeland. So, all events are going to be online on Eventbrite and as always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher today. We can't repeat that often enough or help us in the supporter program. And thank you very, very much, Emmanuel and Minu for this inspiring talk and being my guests today. And thanks again to this entire team for doing their great job week by week again and giving us this very smooth uh, global setting here that just does the job. I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. And thanks for joining us. Hope to see you on Friday. In the meantime, visit you, visit our website and follow us and on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher, Minu. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. It was a great pleasure to have you in the show today. <laughs>